Should Israel matter to believers? If so, then how come some theologians say no? Israel, in response to that vicious Hamas attack on October 7th, is waiting for ground assault in Gaza. One should not imagine how Hezbollah and Iran might respond. So should this development matter more to Christians because it involves Israel? Yes, says a Christian evangelist who currently lives in Israel. I know him personally. I will just call him Ramon. In fact, Ramon declared on his Facebook, quote, Every Christian must love and support Israel. If you don't, you might not be a believer to begin with. End of quote. What? Really? By that definition, Christopher J.H. Wright, an Anglican clergyman and an Old Testament scholar, may not qualify as a believer. Wright says in his 2008 book, The God I Don't Understand, Quote, nowhere at all does the New Testament build any of its teaching about the future of either Christians or Jews or the world around future events involving a renewed independent state of Israel in the land of Palestine, end of quote, aka Canaan. Writes as, quote, the New Testament gives no special theological place to the land of Palestine simply as a territory, end of quote. And certainly not aligning himself with Ramon's Unilateral support of Israel, Wright says, quote, Not all Jews by any means supported the establishment of the state of Israel or approved its continued actions over the past century, and many sincere Jews reject Zionism politically and theologically. End of a quote. Who do you think? As for me, I agree and disagree with both Ramon, the all in supporter of Israel, and Wright, to whom Israel as a nation has no biblical significance whatsoever. As for Ramon's claim, it is flat out unbiblical to question the salvation of someone who believed that Jesus died for his sin simply because his love and support for Israel to Ramon is questionable and not absolute. This is worse than accusing anyone voicing any disapproval of Israel as being anti-Semitic. Ramon's extreme rhetoric, in my opinion, not only divides the church, but it further incentivizes pastors, culturally sensitive ones in particular, to remain silent about the possibility that we may be inching toward the end time. Be that as it may, I do believe, as Ramon does, that the existence of the modern Israel is eschatologically warranted. That is to say, Israel as a nation is the centerpiece as far as fulfilling the end time prophecies is concerned. As for Wright, I totally agree with his conclusion that the land God promised to Israel in the Old Testament, quote, a land flowing with milk and honey, end of quote, Exodus 3a, foreshadowed, quoting from Wright, what all believers now have through Christ, permanence, security, inclusion, rest in Him, to be in Christ, carry the same status as to be in the land, end of a quote. But I disagree with Wright's dismissal of the modern state of Israel as biblically unwarranted. To me, the biblical warrant for Israel's existence in the Middle East boils down to this question, and it's going to sound really weird. Will there be a literal, physical millennial kingdom to be established on earth in the future? If the answer is yes, then Israel necessarily has to exist. If not, then you can agree with Wright, who concludes, quote, The land of Palestine as a holy place has ceased to have relevance for uh, Christians. How so? Well, let me explain. First, note that six verses in Revelation 20 are the only place in the Bible where the Millennium Kingdom is mentioned. For instance, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 6, Aeneas Lee says, quote, Then I, the Apostle John, saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 5. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. 
Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So, is the fact that the millennial kingdom is mentioned only here problematic? Yes, says Wright, who states, quote, My point is simply that we need to avoid getting sidetracked into a whole jungle of arcane interpretation built on shaky assumptions about a term that occurs in one single short passage and nowhere else in the Bible. Thus, he holds a position called amillennialism, literally meaning not or without thousand years, that rejects a literal physical millennial kingdom. It's because amillennialism as a whole spiritualizes most of what's found in Revelation. No wonder then that Wright believed that the term millennium is, quote, a symbolic and metaphorical imagery to imply a long but indefinite period between the first and second coming of Christ. End of a quote. If right is correct, then there is no need for the nation of Israel to exist in the Middle East. Whatever reference to Israel found in Revelation are symbolic and metaphorical. But I think right needs to have a better reason than it's okay to reject a literal millennial kingdom since it is mentioned only in one chapter in the entire Bible. Actually, although Wright doesn't mention it in his book, his position on millennialism does offer an external ground for rejecting a literal millennial kingdom in Revelation chapter 20. Anthony Hoekema, an esteemed cabinet theologian who represented millennialism in a book on comparative eschatology, writes, quote, If one thinks of Revelation 20 as describing what follows chronologically after what is described in 19, one would indeed conclude that the millennium of Revelation 20, verse 1 through 6, will come after the return of Christ. As has been indicated above, however, chapters 20 through 22 comprise the last of the seven sections of Revelation and therefore do not describe what follows the return of Christ. Rather, Revelation 20 verse 1 takes us back once again to the beginning of the New Testament. End of a quote. Did you get that? Hoekema says that chapter 20 does not follow chapter 19 chronologically. But if he does, then Hoekema concedes that there will be a literal mainland kingdom. Now, you read it for yourself whether Revelation 19 follows chronologically Revelation 20. I will first read Revelation 19.11 that points to Christ's return and then the last verse of that chapter, which refers to his judgment. Afterwards, I will read the first two verses of Revelation chapter 20. Okay, 19.11, quote, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. That's Christ. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. End of a quote. Now, Revelation 19, 21, the last verse of chapter 19, quote, And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Now, listen to the beginning of Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. End of quote. Note the first word that began Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. It's the Greek conjunction, chi, that literally means and, which is how NIV begins Revelation 20, verse 1. Quote, and I saw an angel coming down out of heaven. End of quote. So, is it okay to use then, which suggests continuation from the preceding verse, instead of and for the Greek conjunction chi? According to a manual grammar of the Greek New Testament, which was used for the second year of Greek in my seminary, when chi is translated as and, instead of also or even, it is to be understood, quote, as transitional or continuative, end of a quote as transitional or continuative. In view of this, 
then is perfectly acceptable translation for the Greek Kai, which in this case means that Revelation 20 is continuative from Revelation 19. No wonder then that George Ladd, a longtime full theological seminary professor, a Harvard graduate no less, quipped, quote, Revelation 19.20 appears to be continuous. There is no hint of any recapitulation in chapter 20, end of a quote. Meaning what? A literal million kingdom found in Revelation 20 will one day be established on earth. So then what does this have to do with Israel? Once we recognize that there is no good exegetical reason to reject a literal military kingdom in Revelation 20, it becomes apparent that there is no good reason to spiritualize any reference to Israel or things related to her in the rest of Revelation. The truth of the matter is, without a literal Israel in smack in the middle of the Middle East as the focal point of the final aggressions of nations hostile to the Jews, and by extension God, which is foretold in Revelation chapter 16 through 19, the end time scenario makes no sense. For instance, Revelation chapter 16, verse 14 and 16 say, quote, the kings of the whole world assemble for battle on the great day of God, the Almighty, and they assemble them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon, end of quote. Armageddon is in Israel. Why would the kings of the whole world gather in Armageddon instead of, let's say, Beijing or London? It's because that's where Israel will be found. And this is where the nation hostile to Israel, and again by extension God, will be resoundingly defeated by Christ. So yes, the existence of Israel is pivotal to eschatology, and whenever Russia and Iran, to name a few, are making their moves against Israel, we should at least pay attention. Why then? Well, find the answer in my other vlog to follow. Wake up, people. It's time to, as Jesus warned, be on guard, be alert. Don't sleep on this one. Pray.